Well, welcome to the top of uh, Bigner Hill in the car park here, uh, right in the heart of the South Downs National Park. This is one of the designated dark sky sites. It's up a, a little windy lane, but when you get to the top here on a really clear February evening like we've got now, it is a breathtaking sight. Now this year we have a bright moon during February. It's full moon on the 16th of February and the moon will be very bright for that week. But by the 23rd of February, when we're getting to last quarter and the moon is rising much later in the night, then you'll be able to get out without the moon interfering with what you can see. But we can still have a tour of the winter night sky, even with the moon there. And we're gonna start over in the west, which is the direction that I'm pointing to here. It's about 7.30 in the evening and over in the western sky, there is the great square of Pegasus going down. It's a square, but it will look like a diamond because it's setting. And so you've got the, uh, the four stars tilted. So it looks like a big diamond in the western sky. And to be honest, there is nothing else really there in the west. And then you've got a line of stars coming up from the square of Pegasus, which is Andromeda. She, of course, was the beautiful daughter of Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus, about more we'll look at a bit later on. As we move round from the west towards the south and southwest, the moon, of course, very bright tonight, between the horns of Taurus the bull. And just below the moon, we have Aldebaran, one of the bull's eyes, a, a red giant star, about 65 light years away. Now, when we talk about distances to stars, we don't use miles or kilometers because the numbers are just too big. So instead we use this term light year. A light year is how far a ray of light travels in one year. Six million million miles. That's a six followed by 12 zeros. So one light year, six million million miles, Aldebaran, 65 light years away. Now, Aldebaran is within a V-shaped cluster called the Hyades, which is a, uh, a cluster of stars that is about 145 light years away. Uh, it, those stars were all born about the same time. They've been moving slowly apart, making this V-shaped cluster. And although it looks like Aldebaran is part of the V-shaped cluster, it is in fact much closer to us. And of course, although you can't see them very well tonight, also to the right of the moon, we have the Pleiades or Seven Sisters, one of the finest star clusters in the northern sky. The stars themselves were all fairly young. They were born about 100 million years ago from a great swirling cloud of gas and dust in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. The winds from those stars have blown away most of the surrounding gas and dust, leaving the stars now shining, although there are just wisps of nebulosity along the line of sight. The stars themselves are just over 400 light years away. So if you think about it, when Galileo first turned his telescope onto the night sky just over four centuries ago, the light we're seeing now was leaving those stars at that time. And although we say the seven sisters, because on a clear dark night with no moon, you'll see seven stars with the unaided human eye. Actually, there are getting on for a thousand stars in that cluster and telescopes will show a great deal of detail. Now, almost directly overhead here, we have the yellow star Capella. It's 42 light years away. It's the sixth brightest star in the sky. And it's a sort of yellowy star, similar in color to our sun. Although in fact, Capella is two stars very, very close together, a binary system. In fact, multiple stars are very common in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Singleton stars, like our sun, are less common. Most stars have a partner and Capella is one of those binary systems. And Capella is part of the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. And it's a, a box shape of stars. It's sort of a five-sided shape. And uh, the moon is just below the bottom 
of Auriga tonight, so it's very hard to see the fainter stars. But then if we come down from the moon, we have the pride of the winter night sky, Orion the Hunter. There are many legends told about Orion the Hunter. In one of them, Orion boasts that he's the greatest hunter there is and there's no animal that he can't kill. And this rather upsets the goddess Juno and she sends a scorpion after Orion and Orion doesn't notice it and the scorpion stings him on the heel and kills him. And both Orion and the scorpion are then placed in the sky. But they're placed on exactly the opposite sides of the sky. So they're forever chasing each other around as the sky revolves, but never able to catch each other. And it's probably fair to say, but as magnificent as Orion is in our winter night sky, the scorpion is equally magnificent in the winter night sky in the southern hemisphere. The scorpion really looks like the creature it's supposed to be, just like Orion, you can really imagine the great hunter from the main stars that make up the constellation pattern. Now this is a very easy pattern to find, and it's the first thing you should do when you go out on a clear night, is find the three stars of Orion's belt. And there they are, one, two, three. Three stars, equally spaced, more or less in a straight line. They are the gleaming metal studs in Orion the Hunter's leather belt. Above, two stars marking his shoulders, and below, two stars marking his feet. And below the belt, we have Orion's sword hanging from the belt. In Orion's right arm, which is here, he is brandishing a wooden club, and in his left arm, there's a curve of stars there. Over his left arm is the skin of an animal that he's killed. Orion is one of the most magnificent patterns in the sky, and in the winter, it is a highlight. And you can use Orion as a signpost to find other bright stars and constellations around it. Now, if you take the three stars of Orion's belt, they point up to Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, or one of the bull's eyes, and they point down to Sirius the dog star. And Sirius the dog star, there it is, looking magnificent. One of the nearest stars in our sky, it's only eight and a half light years away, and it's a, a, a steely blue-white colour, really lovely, but when we look at it tonight, and most nights, it's flashing lots of different colours. Orange, red, yellow, blue. Look at it through binoculars. It's a fabulous sight. And that's nothing to do with a star. That's to do with the moving air around us. Even on a fairly still winter's night, there'll always be some air movement. And as the star's light comes through the moving air, it makes all stars twinkle. But because Sirius is a bright star fairly low down, and we're looking through a lot of atmosphere towards it, it does twinkle a lot. But what a magnificent star it is. The dog star, the brightest star of the pattern of the big dog. Now we don't see most of the dog very well. It goes right the way down to the southern horizon here. And then as we come over here, we have the little dog with the bright star Procyon. And then high up here, over in the east, we have the twins of Gemini. Pollux, the brighter twin, Castor, the fainter twin. Pollux is uh, 34 light years away, uh, Castor 52, and uh, so they're a little bit further away than Sirius, and also Procyon. Procyon in the little dog is 11 and a half light years away. So Procyon and Sirius are the two nearest stars that we see here. Then we have the twins of Gemini and Capella, which are uh, sort of uh, between uh, 30 and 50 light years away. And then a bit further than that, we have Aldebaran. Now let's look at the main stars of Orion. They all have names. Top left is Betelgeuse, not Betelgeuse, please, Betelgeuse. Then we have Bellatrix, top right. Bottom right, the beautiful Rigel, a blue-white star there. And then we have Safe the bottom left star. So those are the four in the main rectangle. And the three stars in Orion's belt, Mintaka, Alnilam, and Alnitak. Now, when you look at uh, the two main stars of Orion, which is Betelgeuse, top left, and Rigel, bottom right, they are very contrasting 
colours. Betelgeuse is a deep orangey red, Rigel is a lovely blue white. And these stars are both a lot more massive than the Sun. They're both 15 to 17 times as massive as the Sun. But they're different ages. Betelgeuse is late middle age, Rigel a lot younger. Long, long ago, Betelgeuse shone like Rigel and it was probably a blue-white star similarly. And as it grew old, it swelled up to enormous size. In fact, Betelgeuse is such a large star that it was in the middle of our solar system, it would stretch out to the orbit of the planet Jupiter. And this enormous bloated red supergiant star, its surface has cooled as it expanded, and that meant its colour changed from originally blue-white to the deep orangey red that it is now, because the colours of stars are related to their surface temperature. And because the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is about three and a half thousand degrees, compared to maybe 30, 40,000 for a blue-white star, it looks orangey red. So you've got the orangey red supergiant Betelgeuse top left, which is about 640 light years away. The bottom right star of Orion, which is its brightest, Rigel, is about 770 light years away. And uh, as I say, it's a younger version of Betelgeuse, so it's still uh, a highly hot surface temperature, which is white's blue white. But in the far, far, far future, Rigel will evolve and will eventually be like Betelgeuse. But by that time, Betelgeuse will no longer be with us. Because Betelgeuse is in its late middle age, as I said, and that means that in its core, where the nuclear fusion reactions are generating the energy that powers that star, eventually we're going to get a core of iron produced in the middle of Betelgeuse. And when you get a core of iron in the heart of a star, the fusion reaction that sustained the star all of its life switches off in a thousandth of a second. And the star implodes. It falls in on itself, squashing the core to nuclear density. There's then a rebound and the outer layers of the star are blasted out in a supernova explosion. Now we don't know when Betelgeuse is going to go supernova, but it will. And when it does, one night it'll look like this, and the next night it'll be brighter than the moon, but a point source of light, able to cast shadows visible in broad daylight. It'll be an incredible sight. And then over months, years, it will slowly fade as the debris cloud clears, and Orion will then be missing its top left star. And sometime in the far, far, far future, Rigel will evolve in the same way, and it too will eventually explode as a supernova at the end of its life. And when that happens, Orion will then be missing its two brightest stars. Now, the interesting thing about Betelgeuse is it does vary in brightness. Sometimes it's as bright as Procyon in The Little Dog, and sometimes as faint as Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. So it's always worth having a look at Betelgeuse and just comparing it to the other bright stars around. And because uh, sometimes it does dip in brightness, sometimes it's rather brighter. And it's interesting to follow these fluctuations in this enormous bloated red supergiant star. Of the main stars of Orion, Bellatrix, top right, is the nearest. 245 light years away. All the other main ones are between 1300 and 700 light years distant and uh, most of them are white or blue white stars, very hot stars. If you look below the centre star of Orion's belt there's a line of three faint objects and the middle one here is a fuzzy blob and that is the Orion Nebula a birthplace of new stars and new planets. 1300 light years away, it's one of the nearest star birth regions to us in the Milky Way. And if you look at it through a telescope, you won't see any colour, but you'll see this greyish silvery wisp of gas. 
lovely tendrils and arcs of gas if you've got a really clear dark night. And this is a stellar nursery, a place where new stars and planets are being born right now. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to look into the heart of the Orion Nebula with a telescope because there are four really super luminous white stars right at the heart of the nebula. They're called the trapezium stars. And it's the radiation from those stars that are lighting up the whole nebula around them. So the Orion Nebula then is directly uh, in the middle of Orion's sword, at the tip of Orion's sword, low, below the middle star of the belt. So if we go round, we can see around Orion, if we go from the belt to Sirius, we then come up to Procyon, the twins of Gemini, Capella directly overhead, down to Aldebaran and down to Rigel. A six-sided figure, sometimes called the Winter Hexagon. And uh, it's, it's well worth familiarising yourself with the stars in that part of the sky. Between Orion and the square of Pegasus, which as I said is going down in the west, there's a rather barren area of sky. Immediately to the right of Orion, that's to the west, this very empty area here is the constellation of Eridanus the river. It's a long and meandering line of stars that starts near Rigel and meanders its way across the sky and down into the southern hemisphere. And in fact, the brightest star in Eridanus, Achenar, the end of the river, is not visible at all from this country. And then we have uh, Cetus, the whale or sea monster, which fills this other rather barren part of the southern sky. So you've got, as I say, Eridanus, Cetus, the whale or sea monster, Pisces, the fishes, three rather faint uh, patterns of stars. Uh, Pisces is a sort of a V shape to the left of the square of Pegasus. It's supposed to represent two fish tied together by a knot in their tails. A small fish and a larger fish. So this V has got a short arm and a long arm to the V. Uh, two stars that you will see fairly high in the southwestern sky are the two main stars of Aries the Ram, one of the constellations of the Zodiac, the one between Pisces the Fishes and Taurus the Bull. But Aries is a rather insignificant pattern. It's quite hard to see very much at all, except for those two main stars. So turning now to the northern sky, I'm looking slightly north-northeast at the moment, at probably one of the most well-known of all star patterns, the Plough or Big Dipper. Seven stars in the shape of a saucepan, which at the moment looks like it's standing on its handle. Four stars in the bowl, three stars in the handle. And where the handle joins the bowl, we have the faintest star of the seven. All of those main stars have names. We have Dubhe at the top here, Merak, Fad, Migrez, Alioth, Mizar and al -Qaid. And the two stars at the top, Merak and Dulpe, are generally called the pointers because they point to the North Pole star Polaris, which is there. And that shows us exactly where North is. And that is the end of the tail of the Little Dipper or the Little Bear. We've got a curve of stars round and then a little boxy shape. And the other bright star in the Little Bear is Kokab, which is an orangey star, which is just there. And uh, it's um, rather faint stars in the north. We've got the dragon here, the head of the dragon rather low in the north. And then we've got the shoulders and the long tail of the dragon stretches there across between the end of the little bear, the little dipper and the bowl of the plough. So looking high up, we have Cassiopeia. Now, this will look like either a letter W or a letter M, depending on which way you look at it. And if it looks a bit like a W or an M that's been sat on, that's a pretty good description of it. It's supposed to represent the queen uh, in the sky, Queen Cassiopeia, uh, the mother of the beautiful princess Andromeda that I mentioned right at the beginning. And Cassiopeia's husband, the king, King Cepheus, is 
a, a rather uh, difficult pattern to find. You've got a sort of square of stars and then a triangle of stars on the top. I always think it looks like a bit like a house with a high pointy roof. Uh, it doesn't, it's not supposed to represent the king, it's supposed to represent the wooden throne on which the king is sitting. You've got the sides of the throne there and the top of the throne there. So you've got the king, you've got the queen, and the princess Andromeda here from the top left of the square of Pegasus going right up, sort of a, a long curvy V shape of stars. Now Andromeda got in a spot of bother. Her mother Cassiopeia was a very proud and boastful queen and she boasted that her daughter was more beautiful than any of King Neptune's sea nymphs. This was a mistake because Neptune, the god of the sea, was not someone to anger. And he flew into a fearful rage and he sent a great sea monster to ravage the shores of their kingdom and it was overturning boats and eating people off the shore and doing all sorts of things that sea monsters do. The sea monster is represented by Cetus which is the very faint barren area uh, low down in the southwest at the moment. And Andromeda was chained to a rock to be sacrificed to the sea monster because that was the only way they could get rid of this curse that King Neptune had placed on them. Well, at this stage, of course, you need a hero, and we have one. His name is Perseus, the great warrior, and he's directly overhead here, and uh, it looks to me like an upside-down letter Y. There it is. And uh, that's Perseus, the hero, who rescues Andromeda from the sea monster, and they all live happily ever after. So uh, we have the entire cast of a, uh, a cosmic saga here. We've got the king, we've got the queen, we've got the beautiful daughter in trouble, we've got the warrior who rescues her, and we've also, very low down, got the sea monster that causes all the trouble. So one of many myths and legends that are told in the night sky at this time of year. Coming up in the eastern sky, is the constellation of Leo the lion. Now the head of the lion is like a backwards question mark with the star Regulus marking the point of the question mark and the rump of the lion is a triangle of stars quite low over the eastern horizon. But if you follow the line of the, the sickle, the backwards question mark of Leo, down into the east southeastern sky, there is a star all on its own there, and that is the star Alphard, a reddish star whose name means the solitary one. And it really does look a rather solitary star down there, and Alphard is the principal star of Hydra, the multi-headed sea creature. There is only one head in the depiction of it in the sky, uh, and it's a, a long and meandering constellation that passes right below Leo and under the, down below the horizon at the moment. And then it comes up and the head of Hydra is more or less in between Procyon in the little dog and Regulus in Leo. Halfway between you'll see this little grouping of stars and that is one head of the multi-headed Hydra. And Right in between Gemini the Twins and Leo the Lion, again another rather blank area of sky, that is the zodiacal pattern of Cancer the Crab. And all those three patterns, Leo the Lion, Hydra, the multi-headed sea creature, and Cancer the Crab, are all connected with the labours of Hercules. Leo the Lion is supposed to represent the Nemean Lion, one of Hercules' conquests, and also, of course, he had to fight the multi-headed Hydra, and uh, the crab was really sent along as reinforcements to try and help the uh, multi-headed uh, sea creature, the Hydra, in its battle with uh, Hercules. But Hercules turned round and stamped on the crab, and that was the end of that. So all of those characters then connected with the labours of Hercules. Yet more myths and legends from the winter night sky. Now, as I say, with the moon being so bright, it's hard to see 
the fainter stars. But in some ways, when the moon is like this, it's a bit easier maybe to pick your way around the sky and start learning your way around and learning some of the constellations. Because when there's no moon and you're in a really clear dark site like this, you will see a myriad of faint stars and they may confuse you a bit. So in some ways, if you're learning your way around the winter night sky, and I would urge you all to do this, doing it when there's a moon about, in some ways it's helpful because you'll only see the brighter stars and the major star patterns. Of course, for many people, a dark sky like this is not an option. They live in a town or urban fringe area. But it is worth making the effort to go out to a dark sky site, somewhere like this, and just to take in the wonders of the winter night sky. Because a tour of the night sky at this time of year is always a pleasure. But don't forget, if you learn your way around the night sky now, and then you don't come out again for a couple of months, you're gonna find it rather different. Because as the Earth goes round the sun, the stars rise four minutes earlier each night. So where a particular star, if it rises at seven o'clock one night, will rise at 6.56 the following night and 6.52 the night after. And so slowly the sky changes from week to week, month to month, season to season. And although Orion is beautifully placed in our sky now, at about half past seven, quarter to eight. Over the next month, through March and into April, it'll slowly move westwards and eventually be lost in the twilight in April. So make the most of the winter sky, make the most of Orion. It's a wonderful signpost to guide you around the stars of the winter night sky.